Peter, welcome. Take it away. It's all yours. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, it's really cool to get to speak to a bunch of folks online. Um, we've all had to move online, I guess, for our, our naturalist fix over the past uh, few months. But um, I'm really excited to speak to a group of, of kids who I'm, I'm told are really, really into the natural world. Um, I'm, I'm hoping we get some really good answers to our trivia questions. Um, and I'm just here to prepare you with some content for those trivia questions. I'm actually lucky enough to um, be able to come to you guys live from in the field right now. Um, but I'll just introduce myself quickly. Uh, as Becky said, my name is uh, Peter Steiner. I am the Pollinator Project Coordinator at the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. Um, so I work on the conservation and preservation of native pollinators uh, in Mi'kmaq, Nova Scotia, or Mi'kmaq territory in Nova Scotia, um, and especially focused on the effects of climate change on those pollinators. Um, you folks might have heard something along the lines of one in every four bites of food that you take um, has been uh, produced by the interaction of a pollinator with a flower in the past. And um, as there are lots of different climate change effects which are causing our pollinators, our native pollinators, to decline. And that directly affects the health of our, us, us humans and our communities because it makes us less able to produce some basic staples like our food. Um, so I'm going to show you guys some interesting things. Um, talk a little bit about the habitats of these um, animals, our bee friends, and a couple of other different animals. Um, just to help you guys understand how climate change is starting to affect some of these animals and, and why they might be declining. Um, the very first for the very first friends I wanted to introduce you to are these guys right in here. So these are my bumblebee friends. Now, uh, this unit right here, this comes from um, a company online, but the bumblebees inside, they actually came from outdoors. So we collected these bumblebees in the wild last year alongside some youth who were working with the pollinator project in uh, the land and First Nation. Um, and these bees were rehomed in a nice clean box and some nice clean bedding material so that they could work with us here in the Millbrook First Nation greenhouse. Now I'm on the empty side because this is kind of the quieter side with bumblebees. But over there, you guys can see some big tents and stuff where we grow plants for native pollinators, things like milkweed, um, bone set. Um, folks might not know this, but even a few native perennial plants someplace on your property or in your front yard, they can help maintain a really amazing pollinator community for years and years to come. Um, and then over there, you just barely see a row of buckets right up there. So those are going to multiply so that they go all the way down this table over the next few weeks. And those are all full of tomatoes. Now, you might not know this, but a lot of greenhouses that grow things like tomatoes actually have to have bumblebees inside the greenhouse with them so that those tomatoes get pollinated. That's how important pollination is. If you don't have any bees inside your greenhouse and you're growing a bunch of tomatoes, all you'll have is plants and you won't have any actual food. Sorry, Peter, I think your camera is sideways there. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Is it still sideways? Nope. Okay, good. Um, so just to talk to you guys about how these bumblebees live, um, these guys normally live outside in old rodent burrows. Um, so they will move into little burrow spaces that have been vacated by things like rabbits or mice. And I want to show you kind of what the inside of their hive looks like so you understand how climate change can kind of make them move out of that space. Um, so I'm just going to open this guy up right here. Oh, and they don't, they're a little grumpy this morning. They don't really like me opening up their home. But it's going to be okay. I'm wearing my bee suit. Okay. And I have this little thing. Um, a big part of my job is protecting bumblebees and other bees like this by rehoming them. So if someone finds them on their property, 
they can give me a call and I'll come out and I'll move them instead of, you know, them getting hurt by folks digging or, or construction. Um, and I'll put them in a safe place or I'll bring them into a greenhouse like this one. Um, and to do that, I have this little tool here, which is basically just a camera on a stick. So I'm going to move this camera inside their hive, and I'm going to hold up my little screen, and hopefully you guys will be able to see what it looks like in there. So it's going to be like a camera and a camera and a camera, but I think it's probably going to work. Becky, can you sort of see there? Yeah, I can see a little bee on the camera there. There's a slight glare, but I can see it most of the time. Okay. So let's try to go inside here. So can you guys see on the camera screen all those little bees coming out of that hole and the bedding material there? Oh, yeah. So what those little things are, those little orange things, are what are called cauldrons. So bumblebees don't actually make honey, and they don't make a traditional honeycomb. These bees are what we call semi-solitary. So each one of those little cauldrons, those little pots, they're also often called pots, is an individual little bumblebee uh, condo, little bumblebee apartment. And they all do work together. There is a queen in there, but they mostly live pretty separate lives. Um, and bumblebees, worker bumblebees, can actually live for a pretty long time just on their own um, if they don't have a queen present. Um, and that's because a lot of the native bees in Nova Scotia live these kind of solitary lives. So there's a, like evolutionary history of these kind of fending for themselves, not needing to live in a big hive like a honeybee hive. And you can even see in there some larval bumblebees starting to uh, um, get ready to move outside and start pollinating some of our important plants. But um, because they're the shape of their colony, it's almost shaped like a bucket. Um, these little colonies, they can fill with water really easily. And let's move the camera away. You guys can sort of see the material that they like to nest in. Normally, they will fly around and get soft material to build their nests out of. Um, they'll reuse fur and that kind of thing from inside their rodent burrow. Um, and because of their preferred form of nesting material, sometimes you can find these guys nesting in the insulation of houses. Um, this stuff can get saturated with water really, really easily. Now, all of that is important just because one of the big effects of climate change is that we're getting more and more precipitation at kind of the wrong times of year. So we get a lot of precipitation nowadays when these little bumblebees are just starting to wake up after the winter, so they go to sleep for the winter, like dormancy. Um, with all of that rain and the fact that they live underground, they can actually get flooded. Um, their nests can get flooded, and they're left without a habitat. But even more importantly, and this is um, a really important factor in the decline, these guys here are a wild, a species found in the wild, called the eastern bumblebee. Um, and I always like to tell people, let's see if I can get a bumblebee on my hands here. When you're identifying bumblebees, the trick is always to look at the butt. The butt always tells you what type of bumblebee it is. So the stripes and that kind of thing on the butt. Eastern bumblebees always have a completely black butt. I'm not sure if you can see that there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and the bumblebee we're most concerned for in Nova Scotia is a type of bumblebee called the yellow-banded bumblebee. So its butt is almost completely yellow with a tiny little black point. And on that black point, there are even more little yellow stripes. And that type of bumblebee is really at home in places like heat bogs and the Cape Breton Highlands, um, places that normally have a fair bit of water in them and lots and lots of different plants. But because um, we're getting even more water Sometimes there's too much water for them to live properly in those those places. But more importantly, some of the plants that they depend on are starting to disappear. Um, these bees 
Um, more than honey, more than any other type of bee, they're really important for the pollination of things like blueberries, cranberries, and apples that Nova Scotia depends on. Um, and that's because they do something, you guys might even be able to hear it a little bit, bumblebees are defined, they're, they're most the, the biggest part of how you recognize a bumblebee at the side from its size when you're out and about is its buzz. And that buzzing noise is something that they always make, even when they land on a flower. Now, uh, that type of what we call buzz pollination, when they land on a flower, that means that they're cons consistently vibrating that flower. So not only do they take some pollen onto their little boots and move it from flower to flower as they go from flower to flower, they also vibrate a bunch of pollen free from the flower and onto the wind. So for things like blueberries and things like cranberries that grow really close together, um, that's really a really important form of pollination. That's how most of the blueberries actually get pollinated. Same thing with apples. Um, but unfortunately, because of some effects of climate change, things like blueberries are starting to bloom later and later. Even apples are starting to bloom. Well, actually, apples are starting to bloom a little bit too early. Um, there's all of these different interrelated effects from how things are getting warmer or wetter that are causing the flowers that these bees need to survive to not be present when they're getting they're waking up in the winter. Um, and that's really important because a lot of these bees are what we call obligate with a certain type of flower. So, for example, the um, yellow banded bumblebee only has a few very specific flowers that it likes to eat and pollinate. Those are native plants, plants native to Nova Scotia. And because of human use of land and things like climate change, those flowers are disappearing. Um, and though we can move our bumblebees inside and, and sort of keep them happy in these, these husbandry spaces, um, it's way more important to make sure that we're actually growing like all of those plants over there and planting native plants that can support them at the right times. So I'm going to put these little guys back underneath in their little big zone. And I'm just going to show you what um, one of our hand-built bumblebee habitats outside look like. So not only do we try to give these guys spaces indoors where they're safe from the effects of climate change, we also build little habitats, very simple habitats outdoors, which give them a safe place where they can resist some of the flooding and other effects. And that looks just like this. So here, there's a little entrance tube. And inside that flower pot there is a bunch of nesting material, nice dry, soft nesting material, um, and a little bit of rodent droppings. <laughs> uh, drop, droppings from one of the pollinator project's participants, Chirbel. Um, just to make it smell like a place that they could move into. Hmm. And because the bumblebees inside are so close to this one, they're probably, they're, they're queens later in the season, they're probably going to move into that space. Um, but we can build tons and tons of these but all over the landscape and all of this over here is actually wild oregano which is an amazing bumblebee plant so we have this interaction between really tasty good habitat forage for bumblebees a nice dry safe bumblebee nest and this setup here is a really really great conservation amendment what we call a habitat amendment to try to support our native bumblebees from Disappearing. And these are super easy to build. We actually have a little video on how to build one up on the, uh, the Pollinator Project uh, Facebook page if anyone wants to go and take a look. Ooh. Now, um, the other bee I wanted to introduce you folks to is uh, waiting for us in the greenhouse. And I won't have to use my bee suit for this um, because, like a lot, of our native pollinators, um, this particular type of bee actually doesn't have a stinger. And not only does it not have a stinger, it's non-aggressive, uh, it is very sweet, has a really, really sweet demeanor. Um, they're just starting to wake up at this time of year. <coughs> 
this is a type of bee you might have heard of before. It's called a mason bee, or a blue orchard bee. So I brought a few of them. We run the uh, Better Seed Me Land Nebo runs a program called the Young Pollinator Initiative or the Youth Pollinator Initiative, where we actually ask um, people who are interested in beekeeping to work with some of these native bees as opposed to honeybees. Um, not just because they need their support. But because when folks talk about pollinator decline, they're actually not normally talking about honeybees. I'm actually in Nova Scotia because of a couple of different Department of Agriculture programs. Um, honeybees population have increased by about 225%. So when we're talking about pollinator decline, we're normally just talking about these native solitary bees. Um, and because they're so easy to keep, um, I actually grew up, uh, I'm actually from Kentucky, and I grew up on a farm where my granddad used to keep um, mason and leaf cutter bees to bring to farms in the area in order to pollinate things like their apples and blueberries. Honeybees are actually really lazy. Um, any apple farmer will tell you that they're not that great at pollinating their apples. Normally, farmers have to bring in the whole bees like we had in the back of the green um, And these... Uh, solitary bees, but they're actually way better even than bumblebees. Um, they're so good that their name is actually uh, the Blue Orchard. Now, these are um, cones that were collected from um, the pollinator project uh, last year. What we do is we put um, bee hotels in the community garden pollinator gardens that we develop. And a bee hotel looks just like this. So you can see all of these little guys here are the tubes that a solitary bee would normally live inside. I'm going to pull one of those out. Oh, I think you're sideways again, Peter. Oh, let's try that. How's that? Is it any better? Oh, I've got a slight leg, so I can't tell yet. <laughs> I don't think I still see sideways. Well, let's try that. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like we're spinning around the greenhouse. I think we're still sideways, though. Oh, dang. Okay. Oh, well. That should be better now. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. Okay, good. So, um, normally, what happens is a pollinator, a native pollinator, will lay its eggs in a tube like this. And they lay them in a row, so all of the female bees get laid at the very back, so they wake up last. And then all of the male bees are laid at the very top, right here. Because they wake up first in the year. Um, I'll show you what their cocoons look like, but they're all arranged in a row, one by one by one, all the way down this tube. And uh, normally in the wild, they actually use tubes made out of plant material. And I'll show you a plant that they're actually normally living inside. So these guys are a type of reed or reed grass, and these are actually what we make our tubes in this bee hotel out of. So we cut little lengths of this reed, and you guys can see that that is hollow. We paint it white so that you can see it a little bit more easily, and then we put these tubes right in or be hotel. Um, and this, these kind of reeds, these reeds with the, these smaller reeds with a hole in it, are what native pollinators actually normally live inside in the wild. 
So they will live inside here, um, inside specimens of fireweed, inside old milkweed canes. Um, but this grass that I'm holding in my hand, this is actually an invasive species. And that's one of the reasons we use it for making our pollinator nests. Um, two uh, uh, plants that grow and make tubes, like this Phragmites grass and Japanese knotweed, if you cut it down and you dry it, you can use it as material for native pollinator nests. But also, you're helping reduce the spread of these species. Um, sometimes digging it up, uh, digging up these invasive plants just causes the root to spread even further. So the best way to control it is just to cut down the, the aerial part of the plant, the part that grows above the ground. And not only can we do that, but we can actually use the remnants of these plants to make materials to support native species. Um, so I'm going to show you guys what um, the cocoons and even what a little bee looks like. So this guy's really sleepy. He's going to be super dopey. Hopefully he'll move around a little bit. So you guys can see in my hand there. A bunch of tiny little cocoons. I'll hold one up to the camera. That little tiny ball right there, that is what a mason bee lives inside. <laughs> These are called blue orchard bees, and hopefully I can show you why. Because they're bright blue. Oh yeah, he's super, super sleepy. Come on, little guy. One of the reasons I know it's a he is if you guys can see that little white mask that he's wearing right on the tip of his nose. The male blue orchard bees all have that tiny little white mask on the very tip of their nose. Now, he hatched out of this little cocoon right here. You guys can sort of see it right there. It's all hollowed up. And they hatch just like chicken eggs. They um, eat their way out once it starts getting warm. Oh, there he goes. He's starting to move around. I'll hold him up to the camera. So one of the ways to recognize this type of native bee the Latin name for the type of bee in Nova Scotia is Osmia lignaria propinqua. So we have our own subspecies of blue orchard bee out here on the east coast. Cool. So you can recognize them by their giant antlers, their blue color, and just how gentle they are. These guys are so, so sweet, so gentle. I like to say that they look a little bit like snowmen. Their bodies are super, super round. They have this big circle up here, a slightly larger circle right in the middle of their body, and then their butts are super round. Because um, their stinger, they do have one, but it's super reduced. It actually can't penetrate human skin, and they, they hardly ever use it. So cute. Yeah, they're really cute. And these are the guys that work really hard to pollinate. Things like our apple orchards, or shad bush, or service berry. And, um, most importantly, in my opinion, um, these native pollinators are also responsible for um, for making sure that uh, even in very isolated places, honey honeybees are something really strongly associated with agriculture. So honeybees have lived alongside humans for so long that they really only go where we go. We bring honeybee hives to farms, we bring honeybee hives to places where we want to harvest honey or for our, our, our human-produced, what we call our horticultural plants to grow. But these bees are responsible for the pollination that happens in the woods, in the places where humans don't go. Um, these are bees that have been practicing pollination of our important and culturally anchored plants um, since time immemorial in Mi'kmaq territory. So even if you don't see them, some of these types of bees, they burrow in the ground to nest, and people even confuse them with ants. Um, some of them, obviously, they nest in little hollows and tree trunks or in, in uh, the canes of plants. Um, oh, he's super dopey. I'm going to actually put him down. Oh, he doesn't want to let me go. <laughs> okay, well, it's good. Um... 
And not only, I, I wanted to make one other point, which is that um, these bees, uh, because they don't service, they don't provide pollinator services to our horticultural plants, um, they often starve to death at this time of year. So these little bees, these cocoons, we actually have been keeping them in a fridge to delay their hatching for a number of months. Because nowadays, folks might have noticed that the blueberries on farms are already flowering, but the blueberries beside the road, what we call the wild blueberries or lowbush blueberries, they haven't started flowering yet. Um, that means that there is this unfortunate mix of food. Um, because of climate change, wild blueberries are flowering too late for these bees to use to uh, kind of top up their energy reserves after they come out of dormancy for the winter, after they hatch. Um, and the cultivated blueberries we have, they bloom too early for them to eat. So when they wake up, they're in a food desert. There's no food for them to eat, and sometimes they starve to death. That's one of the other climate change factors which is causing the, this type of bee to decline. Um, and so as, as human conservators, as human stewards, one thing we can do is try to plant plants that we know will be flowering when they hatch. Um, and also, if we can collect and clean their cocoons of disease, we can put them in a space where we know that we can delay their hatching until we know that there's a lot of food available for them. And those are our little blue orchard bees. Um, I wanted to introduce you guys to one other type of pollinator. Becky, how am I doing on time? We're good. Yeah, and keep going. Okay, good. Um, so I have a couple of cool things over here. So this is my bee box. So I take it all over Nova Scotia when I'm speaking to youth in different First Nation schools. Um, these are all the bees of Nova Scotia. I'm not sure if folks are aware, but there's over 200 species of native bee in Nova Scotia. From bumblebees, these big ones up here, to tiny, tiny little mason bees right here, and even, there's a bee in this case, I'll try to get close to it, which is named in honor of the Mi'kmaq people. This tiny little guy right there, it almost looks like an ant. Um, this is a type of uh, mining bee called Serotina Mi'kmaq. And that's because it's found in coastal communities, often really, really close. They like to burrow in sand. And it's often found in a really close association with Mi'kmaq communities. It has been responsible for the pollination of Mi'kmaq crops since you know, time immemorial for a really long time. This little bee is really, really important to North America. And in this whole case, of all these bees, there's only three bees which are not native to Nova Scotia. And that's down here. Those three bees right there. The honeybee. Honeybees are actually not native to Nova Scotia. They came over with European settlers and unfortunately, because we grow crops specifically for honeybees, and because of some other competition factors between honeybees and native pollinators, honeybees are actually a big factor in the decline of native pollinators. So if you have enough flowers and food resources in an ecosystem for both types, um, they can both survive, but in general, um, if there are lots of honeybees in an area, they can steal the food that these native pollinators need to survive, which is a little sad. Now, I don't think I've got... Yeah, so right here, see if I can, I'll take my camera off so you guys can get a really good view. Right here is an example of the yellow-banded bumblebee. So this is the endangered bumblebee that I was discussing before. And actually, again, online, the Pollinator Project is a bunch of resources, these little identification cards for bumblebees that can help folks. You can take them out when you're camping or whatever. Um, and if you can take some pictures and put them up on iNaturalist or something, you can help us, you know, folks like me who work with pollinators, track where these endangered bees um, and where some of these other pollinator bees might have been seen and make sure that we're keeping tabs on how these species are declining over time. Now, I didn't want to just focus on the bees, 
There's another important pollinator that you, you might be familiar with. Um, and that are what we like to call bupes. I can never pronounce that word. Becky, are you any better at it than me? Nope. So you you crested, you pressed, yes, boop, you black. Guys, I am so bad at saying that word. You have no <laughs> idea. Uh, beetles. What I'm saying is beetles. Basically, the type of beetle um, that you might know at this time of year as a June bug. So this is a little preserved June bug specimen I have to take around to fossils. And if you can sort of see, let, let me make sure I've got the right end facing it yet. But you can sort of see um, right on its chest there, it's got a bunch of fuzz. So another name for this type of beetle is a flower chafer. Because they like to crawl into flowers and munch on pollen balls and on the petals of flowers. Now, while they're doing that, all of those little hairs on their chest are picking up pollen. And when they crawl into other flowers to eat other um, pollen, they're actually causing a pollination event between plants. They're, they're exchanging this message that plants need to receive in order to make seed. And um, that all goes to show that I know there are a lot of folks out there who hate June bugs, who don't like seeing them in their house or in the soil. Um, don't kill them. Leave them alone. Because these, these little guys, they're really actually quite important for pollination in North America. Any beetle that kind of looks like this, this little Ugh, I'm going to say it again. You pressed it. You pressed it, beetle. <laughs> um, and the very last thing I wanted to talk about are um, the big bad, everybody's least favorite um, animal, the wasp. So I'm looking at right now a picture of a wasp eating uh, one of those beetles I was mentioning. So that's a really big difference between bees and wasps. Wasps are carnivores. Wasps eat meat. They hunt other bugs for food. And um, that's one of the reasons that they're so smooth and, and heavily armored, because they are out on the wing hunting other bugs in order to keep themselves and keep their young. So in that picture there, you actually see a type of wasp called the Kerkeris wasp. Um hunting one of those beetles I just mentioned uh, in order to eat, in order to provision its nest. Um, that's a pretty big one, as you guys can see, but there's all sorts of different types of precarious wasps. Um, and one of the smallest ones, is as small as the head of a pin, actually hunts a type of aphid called the woolly aphid. I'm going to show you what that looks like here. It's going to be a little bit tough to see, but this is on the side of an apple tree I brought into the greenhouse. If you guys can see that tiny little white dot there. Oh, yeah. That is what we call an aphid mummy. So, precarious wasps are parasites. Not only do they eat these bugs, they fly around, and then they use their paralyzing venom to paralyze these animals, and they lay their eggs inside of them. And... That means that in this, in this time of year, in the spring, little new wasps are going to hatch out of these little aphid mummies. That might sound pretty bad, but because woolly aphids are a huge problem for apple growers, this is a little apple tree twig, um, those wasps are actually really important. And when, when apple growers spray their orchards, they kill all the bugs in the orchard, even the bugs that are going to prey on the species, which can um, help them keep their apples safe from things like aphids. So these precarious wasps, um, they do pollinate. Wasps uh, will, will pollinate flowers because they need to take little sips of nectar from flowers in order to keep their energy levels up, even though they don't eat pollen. Um, and not only do they pollinate, but these precarious wasps, if they're in your apple orchard, they're actually helping keep your apple orchard more healthy. And this is a, a type of native wasp in Nova Scotia. Most importantly, this type of precarious wasp that I was showing you earlier, this big guy here, it actually hunts an invasive species called the emerald ash borer. 
So when we spray these pesticides like neo neonicotinoids, neonix, which can accumulate in bee bodies and cause them to die, not only are we weakening our pollinator systems, but we're weakening these biocontrol systems that an ecosystem has to um, try to react to things like invasive species like the emerald ash borer. I've got a lot more to show you, but that you is it trivia time? I think my watch is trivia time. Yes, yeah, so we should probably move on to trivia, but I do have a few questions waiting in the queue here. Um, we can oh, take yeah. time for that first. Um, we've got some questions about the bees themselves and then some questions about um, farms and stuff. So one question we have is, um, so why don't the bees fly away when you open up the container when you were dealing with your bumblebees earlier? Why are they so uh, sluggish? Um, well, the first reason they're so sluggish is because it's early in the morning for them and they're pretty cold and they're still moving slow. Um, but the, the other reason is that um, most native pollinators have a really, really short flight path. So you might have heard that honeybees can forage as far away as six kilometers from their hive. Most native pollinators, and that includes bumblebees, have flight paths as short as 300 meters, or um, you know, at most maybe a kilometer, but generally around 300 meters. So they, once you introduce them to your, your home, your property, they'll probably stay there for a really long time. Um, and they don't want to give up their homes too easily because they put a lot of work into sticking around there. So though they're not really aggressive, though they don't really like to sting or they can't sting, they'll still try to hold on to their home instead of running away because they just don't have the, the energy or the ability to fly very far. Cool. And uh, we also have a question from Tanya and Peyton um, about the mason bees. Could you mistake a mason bee for a fly? I'm sure a lot of our young naturalists have seen be looking like flies. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a really good observation because bees in a family of flies called the Cirquidae or the hoverflies are really, really closely related. Um, people mistake uh, different types of bees for ants with wings and hoverflies all the time because they're all part of the same evolutionary branch, the same part of the evolutionary tree. Um, so it is easy to determine it, it is easy to confuse them, rather. But um, there's a couple of different really good ways to make sure that it's a bee and not a, a fly. And one of those is that bees can fold their wings all the way um, all the way onto their backs. So they can put their wings completely away, and flies always have to hold their wings at an angle. So when they land, their wings are always at like a 45-degree angle from their body. But bees can slot them away in little pockets right on their back. Cool. Oh, so that's and a good way to tell. Way what was that, sorry? Oh, so that's a really easy way to tell, is look at the angle of the wings. Yeah. Um, and another good way is, is the eyes. Of fly eyes are always huge. They're way bigger than bees' eyes. So um, they're always really kind of, they look at, flies always look a little bit cross-eyed. Um, their eyes are so big that it looks like they're looking in two different directions at once. <laughs> All right, good stuff. Um... So we, we've learned about a bunch of different bees and other pollinators today. So I know our, our families have been learning about the process for designating uh, species at risk in Canada and Nova Scotia. And so we know that pollinators in general are facing a lot of problems in Canada and Nova Scotia for reasons you told us about. But I wonder if you could tell us a bit about uh, some of our are really endangered bees, you know, why are, why are those bees so endangered? And, and maybe what do you consider to be our, our most at-risk bee? Um, well, I, uh, the biggest reason, the thing that I want you all to take home with you, is that the biggest thing challenging our native pollinators and the two endangered bee species in Nova Scotia, the yellow-banded bumblebee and the Sable Island sweat bee, which is a mining bee that lives underground, are human land use. So we're causing a lot, these, these pollinators, a lot of people think that if it's getting warmer in Nova Scotia or other places, these will just move to a colder place. But because these bees have developed these really long relationships with the flowers that feed them and that they pollinate, um, they have to stay where those pollinators, where those, those flowers are. 
So a researcher in Ottawa actually described bumblebees as being squeezed in a vice. It's getting warmer in the north, and it's getting warmer in the south, but they have to stay with the flowers that feed them. And so the range that they can live in is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And in that range, the flowers that they need to feed them are disappearing. So the most important thing to remember is that native bees need native plants. They don't need apple trees. They don't need lettuce. They don't need tomatoes. They really need native plants. And planting even a few of them on your property can go a really long way to making sure that we don't lose these bees. Mm. Um, but actually, the most endangered bee that we have in Nova Scotia lives just on Sable Island. Um, and it's Sable Island sweat bee. And it's being really strongly threatened by the fact that the sea level is rising. So places where it would normally nest on the beach are starting to get put underwater. And also, there's an invasive species on Sable Island, which we all love. But the horses of Sable Island can actually eat all of the native plants that the Sable Island swept needs to live. Um, and between those two factors and tourism, um, they're really losing a lot of the space that they need in order to make their nests. Mm. Tough to be a Sable Island sweat bee. It is. Uh, that's a good segue into my next question, because I know this is going to come up in our trivia. Maybe could you tell us a bit about the relationship between bees and bee health and fire and cows? Absolutely. Um, so uh, folks might know that the Mi'kmaq people um, have a tradition of burning blueberry fields. Um so that's for a couple of different reasons. Uh, folks might know that you have to sort of cut back or burn blueberries every other year in order to make sure that they keep producing blueberries. Um, but that also has happened since time immemorial, just by natural happenstance, wildfires are a thing which happen. Um, uh, and grazing, not just cows, but grazing by you know, things from a moose to elk. Um, they did used to be elk here a long time ago. Um, the, uh, those two factors have the, the tendency to clear land. So you might know that meadow flowers like lupins and, and other native plants, um, they don't grow super well in the deep forest. But when these wildfires move through or when grazers move through an area or when you know, even humans like the Mi'kmaq people burn an area for, for the productive use of blueberries, what happens is it makes space for all of these other plants, these little flowering plants, even like goldenrod or milkweed or uh, bone set, um, to sprout up and uh, provide even more food for pollinators. Um, so though that kind of land clearing event is really important to help them survive. Yeah, that's super cool. So those kinds of activities promote different kinds of plant communities, which these depend on. So that's super fascinating. Uh, maybe what I'll do at the end of our presentation, um, I will uh, get Peter to send us a list of some flowers that you guys could plant at home um, that we know we know our native plants and that we know our bees would like. So you guys can do a little stewardship project on your own. And Peter, before we get into trivia, did you want to tell us um, about your youth pollinator project again and how the kids could get involved in that? I'm just going to take my camera off again so you guys can see it really well. Um, but... Beck, what Beck was saying before, so we have, we're running what we call the Youth Pollinator Initiative. So this is, it lasts for a really long time, so we're having our first online meeting this weekend on Saturday, June 6th, from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, in order to, to kind of sign up, you just have to send an email to me, the, the project coordinator. And what you get as participants is a kit. So you get a bee hotel, what we call an emergence chamber for the cocoons that you saw earlier. Um, and a set of cocoons for mason bees, leaf cutter bees, and some ground nesting bees. And then over the course of the season, we're going to learn how to keep these bees safe in husbandry. And we're also going to deliver a bunch of native plants to you to plant around your property in order to help keep your little community of native pollinators uh, healthy. That'll also have the effect of you know, keeping your community a bit more healthy by, by helping your community gardens or your own garden. Um, these guys are really, really hard workers. Each little bee works between four and eight times harder than a, a honeybee does. Um, and we're also hoping that we can pair some of our YPI participants with farm partners 
So you can take um, some bees out to a, a local farm. It's going to be all no contact, so you won't be meeting any anyone, unfortunately. But um, these farms have welcomed some YPI participants onto their property to place emergence chambers, and in return, YPI participants will get um, a little honorarium, like a CSA of garden produce, um, in return for the pollination services they're giving to the farm. Cool. And actually, if any any of you folks listening know know any farms who might be interested in taking part. We've only got seven partners right now, so we'd love to increase that to a few others. Cool stuff. Thank you. Name, or you can send in your answers from your, your pen and paper uh, to yncns at yncns.ca. I'll make sure it's in the chat for you. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for joining us for this whole series. Um, this has been super fun, and I think we're definitely going to have to do it again. Um, there's definitely a lot more um, species at risk that we could learn about, and there's just a lot more wildlife in Nova Scotia that we could learn about. So we will we'll keep you posted on uh, whether we, we do this again and when. Uh, in the meantime, I will be sharing information uh, about our Youth Pollinator Initiative from Peter today uh, on Facebook, so you guys will have that. Um, if you're not already following the Young Naturalist Club, you can find us on Facebook, or you can go directly to our website to see what's going on. Um, and you can also follow the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, where Peter's working, uh, and follow some of their, their climate action stuff. Peter, did you have anything else that you wanted to say before we signed off? Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention, and uh, if I can take a little bit more time, I won't take more than like 30 seconds. Um, in addition to the Young Net or to the uh, Youth Pollinator Initiative, um, we're also running something called the Butterfly Buds Program. Mm. So in here, I actually have a bunch of eggs. You can sort of see there on those maple leaves oh. of the native silk moth, their cacropia moth. Um, and the thing, the, the climate change factor, which is really affecting moths right now, is actually something that everyone who lives in the city knows about, which is light pollution. Because um, moths fly to the brightest light, and that's not always so good for their health. So um, the Butterfly Buds program delivers eggs, butterfly eggs, and a little butterfly habitat for raising them to participants. Um, and we also meet online every week on, on Friday. It's not on Mondays for us Saturdays. Right? Super fun. Well, I'll get all of that from you, and I'll make sure that it's um, shareable so you guys can, can follow that as well. So if you've forgotten anything today, it will be on, on Facebook for you. All right. Well, thank you, Peter, so much for joining us and teaching us all about bees today. We learned a lot, or I definitely learned a lot, and uh, we're going to have to set up uh, an in-person field trip for sure. Yeah, that would be amazing. Okay. All right, guys, well, we'll let you go. Enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, stay curious. Bye, folks. Bye.